What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell, and in today's video, I'm excited to show you Stafford Gambit Player, some new Stafford theory, and a new Stafford trap that was just discovered earlier this week. I gotta throw some credit over to Eric Rosen, who popularized this dangerous line and beat a 2400 player with it with ease. It actually comes out of the quote unquote refutation of H3. So for you Stafford players, you probably see it a lot, but there's a new line that's a ton of fun to play and will probably take your opponents by surprise. The Stafford itself is an opening against E4 in which we play E5 and now against Knight of 3, we go with the Petrov's defense. White is attacking our pawn and we are attacking whites and usually against the move Knight takes E5, we're going to play D6 kicking this Knight back and then capturing that pawn, equalizing the material. But in this position, guys, as a Stafford player, we don't really care about equalizing material, but only checkmating this king on e1 as soon as we possibly can. So here we're going to play the move knight c6, attacking that knight on e5. And now if the move knight takes c6 is played, we're going to take back with the d-pawn so that our bishop on c8 can get in the game as soon as it possibly can, following a move like knight c3. We're now going to play bishop c5, and just to let you guys know, in chess, the two weakest pawns, specifically in the opening, are f2 and f7, and the reason for this is that only the kings defend them. So it never hurts to play a move like bishop c5 and put some pressure on that very vulnerable pawn on f2. Now guys, there's been a ton of YouTube videos on this from the white perspective covering h3, which is the quote-unquote refutation against the Stafford Gambit. For you Stafford players, you probably see this move a lot, and usually against this, Eric Rosen and others usually go with b5, looking to play b4, attacking that knight, which is currently defending the pawn on e4. However, there's a new line that is very fun and honestly pretty crazy with g5 what on earth is going on we are throwing down our kingside pawns looking to play g4 very soon looking to put the pressure on white now in this position one of the moves white could definitely play is bishop e2 simply trying to get their king to safety as soon as possible and against this we're now going to play queen d4 attacking with both our bishop and our queen that pawn threatening a mate in one and now against castling kingside we're gonna play G4. So guys, in this position, the computer recommends white play the move D3. And even after this, I think that black is a very playable game, but D3 is very hard to find. I personally don't think that I'd find it if I was playing with the white pieces. I mean, it just doesn't make any logical sense. We have a battery ram attacking F2, and right now we're actually putting pressure on the pawn of H3. The trap follows the move H takes G4, but let's cover what happens if white plays the move h4. I mean, this seems like a very logical option. We are currently ahead of material as the white pieces. Why not try to lock things up? Well, the problem with h4, even though it locks it up for a second, it doesn't last very long because now we can play g3, just hurling our pawn down all the way to that square, attacking the pawn on f2 now with a pawn, queen, and bishop. And here white really does need to play queen e1 using all the pieces they can to hold on to that f2 pawn. And now in this position, we can play rook g8, aiming our rook towards the opponent's king, just continuing to add the pressure. And now if we move like d3, we can actually play the crazy move bishop h3, continuing to aggressively go after this king on g1. Notice how white can't take the bishop, because we're simply going to play g takes f2 with a double check of our pawn and our rook on g8, we're simply going to take that queen off the board, and we're simply winning. If a move like bishop e3 is played, we're not going to play a passive move like queen e5 or queen d6. In fact, in both of these lines, white is better, but instead we're going to play g takes f2 with check. Idea being after queen takes f2, we can play rook takes g2. If queen takes, we have queen takes e3 with check, and if king h1, we're simply going to take that queen off the board, take on d4 and here in this position guys we're simply up a piece and we have ourselves a one game i mean we're not only up a piece but our pieces are also much more active white is on the brink of potentially losing this game in just a few moves and here again as black we simply have a one game so guys going back to this position h4 even though it tries to lock things up doesn't really work because of g3 and we just have so much pressure on that f2 pawn remember the whole idea of rook g8 followed 
by bishop h3. Absolutely amazing idea for black. Now what happens if white doesn't push the pawn, but instead captures the pawn? That's actually what the 2400 player did against Eric Rose, and at least for a second, it seems as if white is holding this thing together. I mean, they're currently up two pawns of material, and right now we can't take the pawn on g4 because both the queen and the bishop defend it. But now we're going to play another crazy move, h5. We are literally giving up our pawns, throwing our pawn to g4, throwing our pawn to h5. The more pawns that we can get white to take, the more open this king will be for us to checkmate it as soon as possible. In this position, if a move like g takes h5 is played, which honestly is the best move, we still have a minus 1.5 advantage for black following rook g8. I mean, look at the attacking chances black has. We are down three pawns of material, but this rook attacks the pawn on g2. We have a battery ram on f2. We have potential queen e5 ideas, specifically following knight g4, which by the way, knight g4 attacks f2, and then following knight g4, we can play queen e5 looking to mate on a2. We have a ton of ideas here, not to mention bishop h3 very soon here this is a very hard position to navigate as white and it's not losing technically but the computer does have a very nice edge to the black pieces now what happens if white doesn't take the pawn on h5 but instead plays g5 attacking our knight on f6 well in this case we're going to play knight g4 and it's true i mean in this position we are threatening to take on f2 our knight queen and bishop are all ganging up on that pawn but that's not actually the main threat the main threat, let's say white plays a move like queen e1, trying to defend the pawn, is queen e5. Whole idea being we want to play queen h2 with checkmate the very next move. And notice here, f4 can't be played because the bishop on c5 pinning the pawn to the king on g1. And if g3 is played, we can simply take back with the queen and following king h1, play queen h2 with checkmate. And here, if bishop takes g4, we're going to take back with our pawn. And yet again, we're threatening a mate in one here. And if g3, it's still a mate in one. So guys, following knight g4, a move like queen e1 really doesn't work because of queen e5 looking to play queen h2. What happens if white takes the knight on g4? Well, now we're going to take back with the h pawn and look at how active our rook is, specifically attacking h2 and h1. I think here the best move for white is probably g3, in which case we can play rook h3 and we still have a very nice attack. But nearly anything else white plays, let's say white plays a move like d3, we're now going to play g3. Again, key idea guys, put as much pressure on this pawn as you possibly can. And nearly anything, white plays the very next move. Let's say white plays something like bishop e3. We now have the beautiful idea of rook h1 with check. And after king takes h1, this queen maneuver of queen h8 followed by queen h2, giving up our rook, playing queen h8, queen h2. We have ourselves a game over. Now, really quick, guys, let's just summarize that line. I know I went over a ton of variations. Here against e4, we're going to play e5. And against knight f3, we're going to go into the Petrov's defense. If white takes it, we have knight c6. Here we trade off. And against the move knight c3, we're going to play bishop c5, putting pressure on the weakest pawn in chess. And now if h3, not b5, but the new opening novelty, g5, advancing down the king side of the board. If a move like bishop e2, we're going to waste no time playing queen d4, threatening a mate in one. And the very next move, play g4. If white takes, we're going to offer up another pawn. And if g5, we're now going to play knight g4, putting a ton of pressure on f2, but really more importantly, threatening queen e5 and queen h2 with the easy dub. Now here, if white takes the knight, we simply take back with the h pawn. And now if we move like d3, we're simply going to move our pawn down yet again to g3, putting pressure on f2, but more importantly, eyeing that h2 square. I mean, again, let's say white plays a move like bishop e3. We have rook h1 with a check, and now the beautiful maneuver with a mate in two here, queen h8, queen h2, black has won the game at move 15. If you guys would like to learn seven more Stafford Gambit traps, click the video to the left. If you'd like to learn the top four traps of the Ponziani opening with white, click the video to the right. Leave a comment below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.